God gives us all a free trip around the sun each year. Enjoy the ride. The popular author Neil Gaiman writes, I hope that in this year to come you make mistakes. Because if you're making mistakes, then you're making new things, trying new things, learning, living, pushing yourself, changing yourself, changing your world. You're doing things you've never done before. And more importantly, you're doing something. So that's my wish for you and all of us, and my wish for myself. Make new mistakes. Make glorious, amazing mistakes. Make mistakes nobody's ever made before. Don't freeze. Don't stop. Don't worry that it isn't good enough or it isn't perfect, whatever it is, art or love or work or family or life. Whatever it is you're scared of doing, do it. Make your mistakes next year and forever. And we hear from C.S. Lewis. There are better things ahead than any we leave behind. We have come from everywhere to prepare for a new year. We have come seeking rest and renewal as we enter the new year. We have come with burdens and questions and failures from the year past. We have come seeking a new start. We have come seeking peace in a world of strife and conflict. We hope for something new in the time ahead. Mostly we've come to ask you, Lord, to travel with us into this new year. May we enter this new year in faith. Welcome everyone. We're just entering the light of a new year. This worship service is all about preparing for the year to come. You'll find this service a little bit different. There are moments uh, I'll ask you to stop the recording for a minute, take some time to meditate, to think about things for yourself in preparation for the new year. And I hope you find this meaningful because I think every, all of us need to stop as we approach a new year, prepare our hearts and minds to receive the wondrous gift. We now hear our opening song. There's so much sorrow here, so much shame and hurt and fear. And there's grief, feels like the air is never ending the night is long can't find sleep where has peace gone it's so hard to breathe it's time to dream fierce dreams like Mary did dreams like Joseph did new dreams like Jesus did cause those who dream change everything those who dream change everything don't have the words to pray there's no comfort no joy today where is love we long to see a new beginning the night is long can't find sleep where has peace gone it's so hard to breathe it's time to dream fierce dreams like mary did brave 
dreams like Joseph did new dreams like Jesus did cause those who dream change everything those who dream change everything oh seeds grow in the dark oh hopes born in the dark oh dreams start in the dark so don't give up don't give up It's time to dream fierce dreams like Mary did, brave dreams like Joseph did, new dreams like Jesus did, cause those who dream change everything, those who dream change everything. change everything I'd invite you now to join me in our New Year's confession Divine, Divine companion, companion from, from the, the beginning, beginning of life to its ending, ending we rest in your loving embrace though, though we, we do not always recognize your presence, presence. Our, our eyes are blind and our, our calendars, calendars are, are too full, full to notice your, your presence. presence. We, we narrowly define, define how you work in our lives and, and often miss your surprises. surprises. Sometimes we cling to the way it used to be. Other times we fling ourselves at anything new and lose the gifts of past tradition. Remind us, loving God, that you are more than our past experiences and future hopes. You are always working for good, and often in surprising, unexpected ways. Keep our eyes open to see. In the name of Jesus, amen. This week we have a slightly different way of doing our sermon spot. It's an opportunity for you to do some guided meditation. What each section will consist of is that Greg, who I'm thankful is helping me today, will read a scripture passage. I'll do a little reflecting and give you something to think about, and then I'd ask you to pause the recording for a minute. Take as much time as you need to reflect on um, that particular part of getting ready for a new year. And then once you restart it, we will continue on singing a verse of O oh God of mercy, God of light, and move on to the next section. So I hope you find this helpful and meaningful as we move into this new year. First reading is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 to 17. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, and we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. God is making us new in this new year. Though we can't totally escape the past, it doesn't define us. We're free to be new and different in this new year. Here's a story from Chicken Soup for the Christian Soul for you to consider. 
Patricia Lorenz was a reporter in 1993. She was having a very rough year. She had been a single parent for eight years. She was trying to support three kids in college, help her oldest daughter, a single mother who had just had her first child. She had just broken up with a man she had loved very much. She was feeling broken and sad. She received an assignment to go and interview another single mom. This woman, however, had had to have a quadruple amputation because of a rare disorder. She was now raising her two teenage sons. So, just after Easter, Patricia took her 13-year-old son, Andrew, along to interview Jan Turner and her sons. When they arrived for the interview, Patricia offered to pick Jan and boys up and bring them to the hotel so the boys could swim while they did the interview. But Jan said she would drive over, and so 10 minutes later, she arrived with her sons using her prosthetics to drive and get around. She drove everyone to the restaurant for dinner, and they returned to the hotel so the boys could swim, and then the women talked. Here's Patricia's record of what happened. Later that night, as our three sons splashed in the pool, Jan and I sat on the side, and she told me about life before her illness. We were a typical single-parent family, you know, busy all the time. Life was so good, in fact, that I was seriously thinking about adopting a third child. My conscience stung. I had to face it. The woman next to me was better at single parenting than I ever thought about being. Jan continued, One Sunday in November of 1989, I was playing my trumpet at the front of my church when I suddenly felt weak, dizzy, and nauseous. I struggled down the aisle, motioned for the boys to follow me, and drove home. I crawled into bed, but by evening, I knew I had to get help. Jan then explained that by the time she arrived at the hospital, she was comatose. Her blood pressure had dropped so much that her body was already shutting down. She had pneumococcal pneumonia, the same bacterial infection that took the life of Muppets creator Jim Henson. One of its disastrous side effects is an activation of the body's clotting system, which causes the blood vessels to plug up. Because there was suddenly no blood flow to her hands or feet, she quickly developed gangrene in all four extremities. Two weeks after being admitted to the hospital, Jan's arms had to be amputated at mid-forearm and her legs at mid-shin. Just before the surgery, she said she cried out, Oh God, no! How can I live without my arms and legs, feet, or hands? Never walk again. Never play the trumpet, guitar, piano, or any of the instruments I teach. I'll never be able to hug my sons or take care of them. Oh God, don't let me depend on others for the rest of my life. Six weeks after the amputation, as her dangling limbs healed, the doctor talked to Jan about prosthetics. She said Jan could learn to walk, drive a car, go back to school, even go back to teaching. Jan found that hard to believe, so she picked up her Bible. It fell open to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. Jan thought about that, about being a new and different person, and she decided to give the prosthetics a try. With a walker strapped onto her forearms near the elbow and a therapist on either side, she could only wobble on her new legs for two to three minutes before she collapsed in exhaustion and pain. Take it slow, Jan said to herself. Be a new person in all that you do, but take it one step at a time. The next day, she tried on the prosthetic arms, a crude system of cables, rubber bands, and hooks operated by a harness across the shoulders. By moving her shoulder muscles, she was able to open and close the hooks to pick up and hold objects and dress and feed herself. Within a few months, Jan learned she could do almost everything she used to do, only in a new and different way. Still, when I finally got to go home after four months of physical and occupational therapy, I was so nervous about what life would be like with my boys and me alone in the house. But when I got there, I got out of the car, walked up the steps to our house, hugged my boys with all my might, and we haven't looked back since. As Jan and I continued to talk, Cody, who climbed out of the hotel pool, stood close to his mom with his arms around her shoulder. As she told me about her newly improved cooking skills, Cody grinned, yep, He said she's a better mom now than before she got sick because now she can even flip pancakes. Jan laughed like a woman who is blessed with tremendous happiness, contentment, and unswerving faith in God. 
Since our visit, Jan has completed a second college degree, this one in communications. She is now an announcer for the local radio station. She's also studied theology, has been ordained as the children's pastor at a church, the Triumphant Life Church in Wilmar. Simply put, Jan says, I'm a new and different person, triumphant because of God's unending love and wisdom. After meeting Jan, I was a new and different person as well. I learned to praise God for everything in my life that makes me new and different, whether it's struggling through one more part-time job to keep my kids in college, learning to be a grandmother for the first time, or having the courage to end a relationship with a wonderful friend who just wasn't the right one for me. Jan may not have real flesh and blood, arms and legs, hands or feet, but that woman has more heart and soul than anyone I've ever met before or since. She taught me to grab on to every new and different thing that comes into my life with all the gusto I can muster to live my life triumphantly. How is God calling you to be new and different in this coming year? Do you believe you're free to be a new creation? Pause the service for a moment and say, take some time to think about it. Let us pray. Lord, make us new in this new year, whatever the last year brought. Help us to be triumphant because of your unending love and wisdom. Amen. next reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 14 to 22, and this is from the Message Translation. The Messiah has made things up between us so that we're now together on this, both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall we used to keep each other at a distance. He repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. Then he started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You are no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here in what he is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. As we enter this new year, we have the opportunity to leave the animosities of last year behind. This new year is a time for division to be healed and all of us to be united in the love of Christ. For just a moment, I want you to reflect on the words from Edward Markham. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. 
We drew a circle and took him in. How is God calling us all into new circles of love as we enter this year? Where can we draw circles that bring people in rather than keep them out? Pause the service and take a moment to consider. Let us pray. Lord, draw us together by your love. Make us one across all our differences so that we can begin the process of entering into the new life you offer. Amen. For all our kindred, far and wide, since Jesus Christ for next reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, 31st to 40th verses. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer then, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Think about it for a moment. In the last year, where did you see your neighbor in need and reach out as if to Christ? In this next year, you can be sure that new opportunities will open up for you all around. Will you be ready to meet Jesus when the time comes? I'd like, to reflect on, I'd like you to reflect on an essay written by Robert Fulgham. He almost left it out of the most recent edition of his book, All I Really Know I Learned in Kindergarten, because he thought it dated. But he couldn't let it go. Can you? He writes, she died in 1997. And this essay was written 20 years ago. I removed it from the new manuscript thinking the sentiments were shopworn, the events out of date, and Mother Teresa a fading memory. So you may well ask, why is the essay included here? Well, seeing it in the reject pile troubled me. I read it several times again, and I realized the essay was not about Mother Teresa so much as it was about me and all those who tried to resolve the inner conflict between self-interest and self-sacrifice. Trying to care about me and care about them and care about us at the same time is an ongoing bewilderment. He writes, there was a person who profoundly disturbed my peace of mind for a long time. She didn't know me, but she went around minding my business. We had very little in common. She was an old woman, an Albanian who grew up in Yugoslavia. She was a Roman Catholic nun who lived in poverty in India. I disagreed with her on fundamental issues of population control, the place of women in the world and in the church, and I was turned off by her naive statement about what God wants. People who claim to speak for God do more harm than good, if you ask me. She and her followers drove me crazy. They seemed so pious and self-righteous. I got upset every time I heard her name or read her words or saw her face. I didn't even want to talk about her 
Who the hell did she think she was, anyhow? However, in the studio where I used to work, there was a sink. Above the sink was a mirror. I stopped at this place several times each day to tidy up and look at myself in the mirror. Alongside the mirror was a photograph of this troublesome old woman. Each time I looked in the mirror at myself, I also looked at her face. In it, I've seen more than I can tell, and from what I saw, I understood more than I could say. I could not get her out of my mind or life. That photograph was taken in Oslo, Norway on the 10th of December in 1980. This is what happened there. The small, stooped woman in a faded blue and white sari and worn sandals received an award from the hand of a king, an award funded from the will of the inventor of dynamite, and a great glittering hall of velvet and gold and crystal, surrounded by the noble and famous and formal black tie and elegant gowns, the rich, the powerful, the brilliant, the talented of the world in attendance. And there at the center of it all, this little old lady in sari and sandals, Mother Tracy of India, servant to the poor and sick and dying. To her, the Nobel Prize. She was given the longest standing ovation in the history of the prize. No president or king or general or scientist or pope or banker or merchant or cartel or oil company or ayatollah holds the key to as much power as she had. None is as rich, for hers was the invincible weapon against the evils of this earth, the caring heart. And hers were the everlasting riches of this life, the wealth of the compassionate spirit. I would not do what she did or the way that she did it, but her presence on the stage of the world dares me to explain just what the hell I will do then and how and when. Several years after she won the Nobel Prize, when I was attending a grand conference of quantum physicists and religious mystics at Oberoi Towers Hotel in Bombay, I saw her in person. Standing by the door at the rear of the hall, I sensed a presence beside me, and there she was, alone. This tiny woman had come to speak to the conference as its guest. She strode to the rostrum and changed the agenda of the conference from intellectual inquiry to moral activism. She said in a firm voice to the odd assembly, we can do no great things, only small things with great love. The contradictions of her life and faith were nothing compared to my own. And while I wrestle with frustration about the impotence of the individual, she went right on affecting the world. While I wish for more power and resources, she used her power and resources to do what she could do at the moment. Gandhi would have approved. He had some strange ways and habits of his own, but he did what he did. Mother Teresa disturbed me and inspired me and still does. What did she have that I do not? If ever there is truly peace on earth, goodwill to people, it will be because of women like Mother Teresa. And watching the millions of women marching in the streets of the world this winter, I was reminded that peace is not something you wish for. It's something you make, something you do something you are, and something you give away. You begin with what you have, where you are, and pass it on. Mother Teresa is dead now, of course. Would you have wanted me to omit this essay because she's gone, or leave it out because I can't settle my own mind about me and them and us? That's the point, isn't it? What she was, stood for, is not out of date or worn out. It lives on as a challenge, not in her in me, in you, in us. How is God disturbing you to see the needs of the world as we move into this new year? How will you respond in the coming year? Pause the recording and take some time to think about it. Let us pray. Lord, help us to see you in the eyes of those who are in need. Help us to respond to you in love in the coming year. Amen.
Our next scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken a seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, in a new year, you can bet there's going to be new things, but it's really all a continuation of the journey we've been on with God and God's people since the very beginning. This journey takes a lifetime. On the path, we remember those who've gone before, and we keep our eyes on the Savior and the end, which is assured, life with our Lord. A chapter closes, a new chapter opens, but it's the same book, and the ending is written. It ends with us finding our place in God's love. The following story keeps challenging me to consider where my vision is focused as I continue on my journey. An old missionary couple had been working in Africa for years, and they were returning to New York City to retire. They had no pension. Their health was broken. They were defeated, discouraged, and afraid. They discovered they were booked on the same ship as President Teddy Roosevelt, who was returning from one of his big game hunting expeditions. No one paid much attention to them. They watched the fanfare that accompanied the president's entourage with passengers trying to catch a glimpse of the great man. As the ship moved across the ocean, the old missionary said to his wife, Something's wrong. Why should we have given our lives in faithful service for God in Africa all these many years and have no one care a thing about us? Here's this man, here this man comes back from a hunting trip, and everybody makes much more over him, but nobody gives two hoots about us. Dear, you shouldn't feel that way, his wife said. I can't help it. It doesn't seem right. When the ship docked in New York, a band was waiting to greet the president, the mayor, and other dignitaries were there. The papers were full of the president's arrival, but no one noticed this missionary couple. They slipped off the ship and found a cheap flat on the east side, hoping the next day to see what they could do to make a living in the city. That night, the man's spirit broke. He said to his wife, I can't take this. God is not treating us fairly. His wife replied, why don't you go in the bedroom and tell that to the Lord? A short time later, he came out of the bedroom, but now his face was completely different. His wife asked, dear, what happened? Well, the Lord settled it with me, he said. I told him how bitter I was that the president should receive this tremendous homecoming when no one met us as we returned home. And when I finished, it seemed as though the Lord put his hand on my shoulder and simply said, but you're not home yet. Pause the recording and take a moment to consider what are you expecting out of the coming year. Then ask yourself, on what am I focused as I face 2021? And will my focus lead me to where I want to go? Take a moment to think about it. Let us pray. Lord, help us keep our eyes focused on you as we move into this new year. Help us remember as we begin another chapter that the ending is already written. And help us remember that the road always leads home to you. Amen. In many and various ways, God spoke to the people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. For our prayer today, I did this last year as well. It, 
amazes me that this prayer is so powerful and so um, appropriate for today. It was written over a decade ago by Billy Graham um, for, the, uh, for the Saturday Evening Post. And so I'm going to use this prayer again this year, um, making a few editorial changes as I go. But certainly I hope you appreciate the power of what Billy Graham asks God for in the coming year. Our Father and our God, as we stand at the beginning of this new year, we confess our need of your presence and your guidance as we face the future. We each have our hopes and expectations for the year that is ahead, but you alone know what it holds for us, and only you can give us the strength and the wisdom we'll need to meet its challenges. So help us to humbly put our hands into your hand and to trust you and to seek your will for our lives during this coming year. In the midst of life's uncertainties in the day ahead, days ahead, assure us of the certainty of your unchanging love. In the midst of life's inevitable disappointments and heartaches, help us to turn to you for the stability and comfort we will need. In the midst of life's temptations and the pull of our stubborn self-will, help us not to lose our way, but to have the courage to do what is right in your sight, regardless of the cost. And in the midst of our daily preoccupations and pursuits, open our eyes to the sorrows and injustices of our hurting world and help us to respond with compassion and sacrifice to those who are friendless and in need. May our constant prayer be that of the ancient psalmist. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. We pray for our nation and its leaders during these difficult times and for all who are seeking to bring peace and justice to our dangerous and troubled world. We especially pray for all the medical workers, the first responders, the necessary workers, all those who in this difficult time have been surrounding us with love and care when we need it most. We pray for your protection on all those who serve in the armed forces, and we thank you for their commitment to defend our freedoms, even at the cost of their own lives. Be with the families of all these courageous people and assure them of your love and concern for them. Bring our divided nation together and give us a great vision of what you would have us be. Your words remind us that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. As we look back over this past year, we thank you for your goodness to us, far beyond what we have deserved. May we never presume on your past goodness or forget all your mercies to us, but may they instead lead us to repentance and to a new commitment to make you the foundation and center of our lives this year. And so, our Father, we thank you for the promise and hope of this new year, and we look forward to it with expectancy and faith. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, who by his death and resurrection has given us hope both for this world and the world to come. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths untraveled, through challenges unknown. Give us faith to go out into this new year with courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great and my spirit sings of the wondrous things 
that you bring to the ones who wait. You fix your sight on your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. Go into the new year in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time to dream fierce dreams like Mary did. Brave dreams like Joseph did. New dreams like Jesus did. Because those who dream change everything. Those who dream change everything. Change everything.